would love for you to tell us who you are and share your story with us. Yes. Well, thank you for having me, of course. Um, well, my name is Marlo, but I also go by Radiant um, and Radiant the Warrior Encourager. I am a, um, an international speaker, songwriter, and singer. I am a lupus warrior and a kidney transplant recipient, and I love to travel the world. So um, because I love to travel the world, and I actually didn't really start traveling the world until, you know, like my late 20s. So um, I eventually started a page called Radiant Now Be, um, which is a place where autoimmune disease warriors can learn how to travel the world uh, safely and enjoyably. Um, so I was diagnosed um, actually when I was 21 years old with lupus. Um, I had the symptoms when I was 20. Um, and, and like many people who have a, um, a chronic illness or an autoimmune disease, sometimes it takes a while before you are diagnosed. But I was fortunate that um, it just took a year. But that year was an exhausting year. You know, by the time I got the diagnosis, I no longer had activity of my limbs. I was just in a wheelchair. And I had a one great nurse practitioner who was trying everybody she could find. And a rheumatologist was the last person. And I remember they thought I had AIDS. They, they just thought I had so many things. But the rheumatologist did all the necessary blood work. And she brought us in a, a week later, my mom and I. And she said, I know what it is. And it's called lupus. And I remember just weeping and crying and crying in the office. And I was crying because there was finally a name. I, I, there was a name to what was happening to me. I knew it wasn't in my head because I saw it happening on my body, but there was a name. So eventually by the time I turned 25 years old, I lost the function of my kidneys to lupus. I started dialysis. Um, I was on dialysis for three and a half years. I had like 14, 12, I began to travel the world. And, and doing music because I am a songwriter and I sing. That's what I do more than anything else. So I began to travel the world. And um, I found out that there's not many places or sites that talk to or that really address people with autoimmune diseases about how to travel the world. So I wanted to do that because I love traveling. And so I've just had a great time just helping other autoimmune disease warriors go see and go travel their world. Um, wherever your world is, whether you can get on a plane or not, there is world to see. So that's what I love to do. So you spoke about um, living with autoimmune illness and traveling the world. Um, yes. What are some restrictions for people who live with autoimmune disease as to mm -hmm. um, why they might be uh, restrictions as to why they can't travel? Yes. So one of the restrictions you may have, and I talk about this in my podcast, is that one, depending on the state of your illness, are you critical or not? That can uh, determine or that can factors in whether you can get on a plane uh, because cabin pressure does different things to different people. Uh, two, it depends on if you have an organ transplant. Um, if you have an organ transplant, I know for myself, I've been told that I can only travel to first world countries. Those are some of the restrictions. Um, another restriction you can have are, um, coupled with your autoimmune disease, are your allergies. Uh, does that country have adequate emergency care? Is mer can uh, you receive medical care as soon as you need it in a, another country outside of your very own? So those are some of the things that you have to consider. And then one other thing, and I know it's really um, important for me as a transplant recipient are vaccinations, vaccinations. Like I can't get live vaccinations anymore. You know, so that means certain countries are out. I, I don't have the privilege of going to see those. Now we're living in a time where we're yeah. amidst COVID-19. Um, how does right. that change your world? Well, one way it changed my world just rapidly I had uh, made plans to travel because I love planes. I love getting on a plane and traveling. I had made plans to travel last week to actually go and record a project. I wanted to record some music for Father's Day. I wanted to put something out special. And I was flying in a producer from Sweden. 
And so once we had the ban, that changed everything. And another way it changed, and that's just my professional life, but as far as my medical life, this whole thing that happens with medical life, um, I have to be extra vigilant. And that's something that one of my specialists pointed out to me um, at the beginning of March. He said, Marlo, be vigilant, wash hands, be careful around people. Um, if you don't have to go somewhere, don't go. And that was before the ban, before the travel restrictions, because you know he understood how precarious it is for a person who, ha who is immunosuppressed. I mean, I take three immuno, um, immunosuppressing drugs a day just to keep a kidney and to keep my lupus quiet. And that leaves me with virtually no immune system. So just a coughing or a sneezing or handshaking transfers things to me and my body's immune system doesn't really work anymore. So I don't have the, the luxury of being able to fight off a flu, let alone COVID-19. And there are so many of us who are like that. We just don't have the ability like we once had maybe before to fight. And this is a this particular uh, virus is coming almost like in guerrilla warfare. And we don't have the protection we need. We don't have it. We, we're not bulletproof against this warfare. In many ways, you are more prepared for this than other people are. Can mm -hmm. you provide some coping mechanisms that can help people um, with the social distancing as it relates to isolation yeah. and mental health? What are some things that have worked for you in the past and what have not worked? Yeah, well, you know what, what works for me, and this is something that I, I do, is music is therapy, okay? So music is therapy to me. You know, um, anything dealing with the arts can be therapeutic, from its boosting of dopamine and lowering the stress hormone cortisol, it, art does that. So when you are quarantined, um, find the art, find the art, find the art in a great film, find the art in the sky, the birds, the trees, find the art, find the art in your life. That's one of the first things that, because that, that eases, that woosahs everything down. I think second is something that I do is I keep a journal. If I'm frustrated, I record it out. Three, I have someone I can talk to. I have someone I can talk to. And I would say number four, um, and I just gave this tip, uh, I know, to some lupus warriors who desire to travel and they can't. And that is, if you want to get out and you can't, do it at home. Find a way, watch that movie from that place. Um, cook, the, cook a dish from that place. Open those canned goods up and pull out some seasonings and get you some Jamaican allspice. Make you something great, okay? Make you some beans and some peas and rice. You know, do something like that. I, I turn on the music. I, I try to learn the language because I love languages. So those are some of the things I do when I am confined in the house. And I've been confined many times. It, you know, anybody that has a chronic illness or terminal illness knows what it's like to have to just stay right there. You don't go anywhere else. We know. And so I, I'm realizing that in many ways you have had challenges um, in the past yes. um, managing your illness, but now there are new challenges for you. What mm -hmm. is the healthcare system like for you during this time as you're navigating this pandemic mm -hmm. as a person who lived with a chronic illness? Well, you know what, for me now, um, the healthcare system is different now. I just got a call from my doctor's office yesterday, uh, my nephrologist, um, who also, who functions as my primary sometimes. Um, this is a new nephrologist. My old nephrologist just retired in December. And the nurse called me and said, um, the doctor still wants to see you um, at your next appointment, which is in about a week and a half. She says, but he's going to do it through an app. We need you to download this app. He's going to talk to you just like you, just like this. Girl, listen, just like you do on a video, he's going to talk to you. I'm like, when did this happen? You know, I'm used to being in an office. So I, I, the question was, do I still need to do fasting labs? Yes, you do. Come as early as possible. You know, that thing. But I'm downloading an app now, and my doctor 
wants to see me and we're having conversation. I'm like, this is new and I actually like this. This is, I can dig this. This is pretty cool. So that's, that's one of the best things that has happened so far. As a patient, what would be your advice to patients on how to be active participants in their care? One tip I have um, done a little, like even I've done a little uh, Instagram live on this, on how to be more engaged as a patient. And one tip is this, do your best to accurately describe what is happening. Um, get you a thesaurus. If it's a pound, a bing, a ting, a zing, lightning striking, it feels like an elephant is on my chest. Be as um, descriptive as possible. Learn to be as descriptive as possible in describing symptoms because different things give different feelings or they cause different feelings in the body. And that has helped me so much in my healthcare profession saying it feels like I'm being stabbed with a knife. It feels like somebody dropped a brick on this. It feels like a woodpecker is pecking at this because doctors somehow can relate better to descriptive things like that in my experience. So be able to describe fully what it is that um, you're feeling. And this, I'll give a second one. And I learned this from my hematologist. He was so good when talking to me about this. He said, one of the best things patient can do, patients can do is call when it's really necessary. And I thought, well, it, well, everything feels like it's necessary. But he said, I know. He said, and sometimes knowing and getting clarity on what is really necessary to call for. Um, and so I'll leave it with those two, those tips. Accurately describe and call when it's necessary. Call. And listen, if they're not listening, call again and call again. Because the emergency room is a dangerous place for a person who is immunosuppressed. It's, a, it's like a cesspool, you know? So yeah, that's it, yeah. Radiant, as we, we're coming to a close on this, um, on you sharing your story, what would be your last words to our audience? My last words would be, one, my mother taught me this, is to live until you die. Live, live a life that is full of quality and quantity and go travel your world, meet people. And when you feel like you are exhausted or at the end of your rope, learn how to catch breath and press on. You have to do that. You have to, you have to live. Yeah. Thank you so very much for your time. This has been truly an honor and a privilege. I am honored to have you. Thank you. Thank you.